how do you go about the business of spanking? I would suggest to you that understanding theology proper will help you to know what your attitude should be when it comes to disciplining your child. God has instructed you, mom and dad, to be his representative, to train up children in the admonition, the instruction of the Lord, and he has given you the authority, if necessary, to use the rod of discipline to chasten them so that what? So that what? So that they just behave? Well, that's, that's a benefit of it, but he's looking for more than that. Discipline should be a picture of the gospel. When we spank our children, it should be to help them understand, okay, honey, um, there are rules, there are, there are laws, and, and, and we're the authorities over you, and you violated our rules that we've taken from God's word, and God has instructed us, because you're going outside of the circle of protection, that we can use the rod to drive you back in so that you understand this is what happens to sinners who don't repent. This is a small, teeny, tiny taste of eternity without forgiveness. So if you continue to be a rebellious child, you can look forward to an eternal spanking. And that is why you need to make sure you repent and put your trust in Jesus so that you can enjoy him forever and not feel his wrath. That is what discipline is. And when we administer it, it should not be like, <laughs> I'm going to try that again. It's not going to get any better. I get to whoop on my boy today. Whoppo. Yeah, baby. Quit running, kid. I'm coming. That's, that's, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. How do I know that? Because of the analogy of Scripture. Because that is not the way that God pours out wrath. That is not the way that God pours out fury. That is not the way God places his disposition toward us. Does God discipline? Of course he does. Does he chasten? Of course he does. Does he send sinners to hell? Of course he does. But it is not like the dad who digs beaten on his kid. He does it, if I could say this, because he has to, because his character and his nature demands it. But he doesn't do it delightfully. He would prefer something else. You say, better have some Bible verses for that, Pally. We got more than a few. Here we go. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. How much favor does God have? Woo! How much? Fury? Like that. Hey. This is, by the way, this is the mime version of the Bible. More verses. This from Isaiah. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. How does God call people? Compassionately. The kindness of God leads us to repentance. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. Again, the context, when God is calling us to redemption, it is loving, it is kind. When he is talking about his fury and his wrath, when he's not in his, if you will, redeemer voice, yeah, we hear fury and wrath, but that's not his preference. More Bible verses from Isaiah. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. You can almost, you can hear it, can't you? Does this sound like a furious God calling people to redemption? Did I say he never pours out his fury? Didn't say that. Analogy of scripture, finding our balance. More Bible verses from Ezekiel. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Declares the sovereign Lord. Rather... Am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? What's God's preference? We've got to break this down. I know that word, that P word, is really controversial. Let's take a look at God's word. 
Do I take pleasure in the death of the wicked? It's a rhetorical question, an emphatic no. It's <laughs> I'm not going to do that again. He doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. Yay, the bad people died. Yay, I killed them and I'm sending them to hell. Declares the sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? God prefers for sinners to get saved because he enjoys pouring out mercy more than wrath. One more verse from Ezekiel. For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking those are Old Testament verses. They don't count as much as New Testament verses. Uh, to that I respond. Here's 1 Timothy. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now I know what else you're thinking, my Calvinist friend. You're thinking, hey, what about the whole election business? I'm not discussing that. Uh, that's not even in view, and I'm, and I'm not going to cloud the waters even with that conversation at the moment because that's not the point of what we are seeing in the text. What we're talking about is what God delights in, what he loves doing. Is it wrath or is it mercy? That's the point. And your, your, your Calvinism doesn't rise or fall with that. It just points out that God is a good God and his character and nature in the old is the same as it is in the new. Uh, one more verse from Peter. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Again, this, this is not a tulip conversation. Happy to have that, but we're not having that. What does it say? He doesn't like it when people perish. He doesn't like it when people go to hell. Why? Because his character and his nature is goodness and mercy and loving kindness. Do you have your theology proper of God in balance? Are you in one ditch or another? Is it possible that your Christian walk is hindered because you spend perhaps too much time focusing on this and then you go, I better correct it, so now I'm going to focus a lot on that and then you go, ah, I'm a mess over there, so I better... But instead, walking that line, feeding from both troughs of theology, God's fury, God's wrath, but also drinking deeply from the trough of God's goodness and His mercy and His grace and His loving kindness.